Thank you all and welcome again. Um, again like Chris said, my name is Kazu, I'm a core member of the East Point Peace Academy, and I have the fun privilege of introducing our speaker today. Uh, so I first met Musham um, right around the time of the Occupy movement. Um, I was heavily involved in Occupy Oakland, and at the time we were doing uh, a ton of nonviolence trainings for Occupy Oakland. Um, at one point, we got so busy that we were doing these two-day workshops on Kingian nonviolence every single weekend, just week after week after week after week. And uh, East Bay Meditation Center was this meditation center that I had heard, been hearing about for years, um, but I'd actually never been to. Um, but East Bay Meditation Center was hosting all of those nonviolence workshops for us free of charge every single weekend. Um, and one of the early ones, uh, Mushim, was one of the attendants. Um, and so I connected with her then. And, you know, after spending so much time at East Bay Meditation Center during Occupy Oakland, I decided that because I've been hearing about this place for years, I decided I wanted to check it out, not just as a place where I'm doing my work, but just to see what they actually do as well. Um, I have a long history with Buddhist practice. I actually lived in Buddhist monastery when I was young, but the tradition that I came up through, we didn't have a silent sitting practice. So I thought I'd go to East Bay Meditation Center and check out this thing called meditation. And so I took Musham's workshop on uh, beginning a mindfulness meditation practice. And that was the introduction to what is now, you know, 10 years later, I've gone to multiple 10-day um, retreats. I try to sit every single day. It's become a really uh, integral part of my life and also my work. It's how uh, I understand the, the work of nonviolence better. It's just the lens that I view everything with. And Mushim was the start of it all. And, you know, not only was she the, the first person that taught me how to do silent meditation, but I remember one time I was at East Bay Meditation Center and Mushim had just uh, sent out EBMC's first ever e-newsletter. And she asked me if I had seen it. And I asked her, I was like, oh, wait, EBMC has an e-newsletter now? Because I, I genuinely hadn't seen it yet. And she thought that I was just messing with her because she thought that I knew that she was the one that created it and had sent it out. And, and so she thought that I was messing with her. And so she gave me this look and she flipped me off. And it was actually in that moment that I feel like I understood like, okay, this is my meditation teacher. Like someone who has incredible deep wisdom, but has like not gone through this process of like spiritual bypassing and isn't like above, like, is, is, isn't like too good to flip someone off, you know? And, and that's one of the things that I've always loved and appreciated about Mushim is, is just that, that combination of, of, of deep spiritual wisdom, as well as just like a human amongst the rest of us. Um, so we're really, really honored and grateful to have her. And uh, it's been an honor for me to call her my, my teacher, my friend over these many years. I'm looking forward to learning from her again tonight. So with that, I will hand the mic over to Musham. Yeah, well, um, thank you all. Can you, can you hear me okay? Administrators? Okay. Um, yes, uh, Musham. Musham, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. Our closed captioning service is not working. So if possible, if you can speak clearly and slowly, I mean, as slowly as possible while still maintaining your flow as I'm typing the closed captions, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. I'm all for access. And I do have something to share with you. And I'm not speaking as um, an expert. Uh, so just back up. I'm, my name is Mushim Patricia Ikeda. And I'm not speaking as an expert here. I'm speaking as a fellow um, voyager with all of you. I'm feeling your presence here in this meeting. Um, and Kazu, I had no recollection of what you're talking about. And I totally believe it. <laughs> so that, yes, that's, that's how it was rolling. All right. As was said, I've been invited to come into this dialogue series. Where do we go from here? A very potent question at this, I feel watershed time for us as human beings and as a planet globally. 
nationally, locally, individually. And I will begin by reading a quote that's uh, gone around the internet quite a bit in activist circles from the very wonderful Sonia Renee Taylor, whose book and website and work is called The Body is Not an Apology. Of course, referring to the flourishing right now of therapies and um, movements to point to the foundational importance of what we call the body only because we become as a society so separated from it. Otherwise we wouldn't need to say the body, it would just be the body. So Sonia Renee Taylor, uh, The Body is Not an Apology, has said this when the pandemic really hit the United States. We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal, other than that we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. And I'm noticing here, I'm not at all speaking for Sonia Renee Taylor, we've never met. I am noticing in the quote, she's not saying our pre-corona existence was not normal other than those other people normalized greed, hatred, and so forth. She says, we normalized it. We should not long to return, my friends. We are be being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and all of nature. One that fits all of humanity and nature. So that's the spirit of the invitation uh, for us to come together as a community and to consider what skillful speech might look like and sound like and be like in uh, really the mindset of it, using mindfulness in a world that if you perceive it as I do, is deeply, painfully, frighteningly polarized. I am, um, was born and raised in the United States. I'm looking around at the United States and um, the divisions that I'm seeing are so deep and due to the pandemic and many other factors, emotions are running very, very high right now. Um, I am in Oakland, California, and, uh, th and this is a time when I feel that mindfulness can be one of our best friends, one of our best tools in the universal struggle for liberation, which in which there is diversity. It doesn't mean the same thing to all of us, nor does it mean that we adopt the same strategies, and therein lies the tensions um, and the, the div divisions and differences which gave rise to my title for today, which is from WTF, which I'm assuming that you all know, however, I assume we're all grown-ups here, I'm just going to say is from what the fuck to, there's a journey to, please tell me more. I consulted my colleague, Melvin Escobar, uh, for what this is in Spanish. And please forgive my, I don't really speak Spanish. I'm trying. Uh, por favor, cuéntame más. So from WTF to please tell me more, skillful speech in a polarized world. I'm going to, um, again, invoke mindfulness, which is, um, it's a strategy, it's a method, it's a series of behaviors and 
of, of mind body things. It's not just an idea. So um, as best we can, if we were all in a room together, I would invite you to look around and we are in a virtual room together. So if you like, please just take a moment. And as best we can, I'm looking at you. And I'm switching to the next page on the Zoom. You don't all have your cameras on and you don't have to. I'm seeing your names as you wish to have them listed. Some seeing some pictures of yourselves. Some of you I know, some of you I don't know. And I honor each and every one of you. So can we feel that in this moment, we are each other's community? We're here, we're connected, and I invite you to just drop into a moment inside yourself, closing your eyes or not, and ask, completely open question, what is my intention for joining in this community at this moment? There's no right answer. It's your answer. Thank you for your practice of mindfulness. So going from WTF to please tell me more. I would say that this is a mindset. This is a way of being in the world for um, the reason of going in the direction of a more peaceful, harmonious, and liberated society and world. Harmonious also with what we call the natural environment, which we would not call the natural environment if we didn't conceive of ourselves as separate from it, just saying. Um, some examples of this mindset of please tell me more um, have to do with opening ourselves to drop out of reactivity and into responsivity. A responsible person is a person able to respond rather than to react. React in the sense of going straight into a habit pattern of where the neural pattern in the brain is so smooth. And um, I have plenty of them as Kazu has just attested. And really all I have to do is get up in the morning and look at the headlines and I'm already, believe me, I am shouting WTF, WTF. And then for a third time, like really loudly, WTF. And then I ask myself, what's my intention? What am I trying to accomplish here? Because I can feel my heart rate go up. I can feel my blood pressure go up, you know? Uh, the people that I, I'm seeing, I'll just say it, maybe as we could say as the opposition here, are not suffering at all from those physical and mental reactions. I am. And I realize that. So some examples of this mindset would be Michelle Obama saying, when they go low, we go high. That's a practice. And most stunningly and recently, uh, Congressperson Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's speech, which has gone viral, in the House of Representatives in the United States condemning sexism in Congress, in language that was fiery, direct, and at the same time respectful and modeling elevate, ele elevation of the public discourse elevation of the public discourse. I am active on social media and I do notice that out of frustration, out of rage, out of overwhelm, all of which I completely experience, that um, there can be exchanges on social media that basically as a mother, and I've worked with many, many children in the Oakland Public Schools as a volunteer, co-op preschool, just been with a lot of kids of all ages over the year up through teenagers. 
So I do know that there is a developmental stage uh, in child development, eh, I think around three, three and a half, uh, when toddlers and kids are playing together and tensions arise, um, which they do because conflict is normal among human beings, that what it can really reduce to as frustration and anger and tensions arise is one kid saying, you stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid. And then that sets the other kid off and they say, "Ah, uh-uh, you're the one who's stupid. And then, you know, it's like you poop head and you this and you that, and no, you're stupid. And you're, it's just various, just fill in the blank for overall insult and put down. Not necessarily because the kids think that they're friends. They don't necessarily think their friend is unintelligent. It's a way of expressing that frustration and that anger. And it's very funny as an adult, actually, as long as they weren't trying to strangle each other, I'd often be in the kitchen just laughing my head off listening to this. Not so funny when we escalate that into adult bodies and people with power and people with um, the ability to set the machinery of oppression and, um, and war into motion. So speaking for myself, in all modesty, I do think that if I personally, Mushim, could control the planet and tell you and everyone what to do, that we would live in peace and things would be excellent. Um, I don't say that because it's not politically correct. I do believe it. And as a Buddhist teacher, many of the questions that I get really boil down to this. I'm suffering and I'm in a situation, how can I change my boss's behaviors, my partner's behaviors, my parents' behaviors, my coworkers' harmful behaviors? How can I change them? And let's um, please take a more sophisticated approach to this in the sense that I'm not talking about, um, I am an activist and I hang out with activists. So I do want to talk, we're going in the direction of movement building and social transformation. And at this individual uh, level, that um, at this individual level, um, yes, go to HR if someone's doing something illegal in the workplace. So you, you get my drift. I vote. Um, so, it's hard to know, yes. Mushim, excuse, uh, sorry, Mushim, I'm interrupted. You, would you mind speaking a little bit slower for the caption? Thank you. I will try. I will try. I have a lot to say. I will try. I know it's hard. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. All right. So, um, and I always say to people who say, how can I change this other person beyond what one can do as a responsible and empowered adult? My uncle voted for you know who. Family get togethers are horrible. What can I do? That would might be a typical question. And I always say, I can't even control my own child, which is not for lack of trying. And I mean, I did raise an empowered child. He's 31 now. And the damnable thing is he's so empowered, he won't let me control him. Um, and so I always say I can't control even my own child, really. Not that he's not responsive to me. Don't get me wrong. So how could I control and change your parent, your coworker, your partner. I've never even met them. How can I change them? And so in thinking about skillful speech in a polarized world, I would invite you to drop into the mindset, if this works for you, only if it works for you. And this is a mindset of mindfulness. 
This is part of our agreements for multicultural interactions at East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland, where I work and where I'm a core teacher. And they're really wonderful agreements for multicultural interactions. And the first one is try it on. So what this means is very importantly, we do not have to agree with someone in order to listen to that person deeply. Deep listening does not mean we necessarily agree with them. We do agree if we listen deeply to try on what they're doing the honor of expressing their worldview, their beliefs, their values, none of which we have to agree with. Would it help us, and this is an open question, folks, would it help me, I invite you to ask yourself, to understand the other person's viewpoint more deeply across lines, often abysses, chasms of difference. It's very challenging. Your answer may be yes or no, or maybe. So I'll give you an example of mindfulness at work, practical everyday mindfulness, which mindfulness meditation helps us to develop. It's like developing a muscle. I do vote and the morning after the presidential election in which Hillary Clinton lost and Donald Trump won, I went to sleep, I saw the election results, I saw the way they skewed, I was very surprised. And I was too tired to say WTF. So I was exhausted and I went to sleep and I woke up in the morning and this reality came crashing in on me. So my thoughts were these, something like, this can't be true. This is a nightmare. What's happened to my country? And then the last one was, this is unendurable. This cannot be endured. With mindfulness, I identified thinking and the thoughts. With mindfulness, we're also invited to lightly label and identify what are the physical sensations. I had a lot of internal pressure in my chest, in my abdomen, and a lot in my head, like intense heat and pressure, almost as though it felt I was going to explode in rage and protest and disbelief. And really, to be honest, have some kind of physical and mental health breakdown. Encapsulated in three letters as WTF. And then I backed off from that and you can see that we've broken it down. We've created some space around WTF. And we've gone into, all right, physical sensations, Thoughts are occurring, we might notice the most prominent thoughts and the emotions, rage, anger, disbelief, um, a feeling of imminent explosion in my case. So for those of you who are not familiar with mindfulness, this is just a quick overview using some very sophisticated screen share. So the invitation of mindfulness is three words, notice, observe with kindness. 
Kindness is a secret sauce. We do our best, by the way. I'm not always the kindest person. What are we noticing and observing? Physical sensations. We're noticing that thinking is occurring and we might write down or isolate the most prominent thoughts without judging them. We're just being very kind. We're noticing emotions are arising and we might again label those emotions. Identify them. Mindfulness and two visuals. It's pretty good. <laughs> I'm actually going to just give myself a pat on the back for that. It's my new method. Um, so at this point, I'm going to invite you to think of a WTF experience you've had. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being totally chilled out, not at all irritated even, like whatever, that's one. 10 is being so angry. You could really do some ultimately bad and foolish thing. I leave it to you to fill in the blank. So one, really not caring. 10, so enraged. You could really do something quite violent. I invite you to be around the, the five around five. So if you like, and you can, just invite yourself to think of about a five range WTF you've had. For some people these days, it's trying to go out and observe community health protocols, wearing masks, physical distancing, all of that, and seeing groups of unmasked people partying heavily in the streets. Uh, that might be more than a five. So whatever it is for you. And I'm just going to invite you, perhaps taking a few deep breaths. Focusing in on your memory of this WTF situation. To without judgment and with kindness, notice and observe. What are you feeling in the body? Pressure, heat, coolness, tingling, heaviness, lightness, expansion, contraction. What thoughts are arising? And you don't need to share this with anyone. So I invite you not to censor yourself. As human beings, we think all kinds of things. We don't have to act on them. We do think them. I think them. Hmm, okay, so thank you for your practice. If that yielded a little moment of insight or something larger. That's a practice I'm inviting you into. And so it does include naming emotions from small to big, from subtle sensations to larger ones. And then the insight that may arise is discovering what's underneath this giant hot mess. In my case, the morning after um, the election results, what it really boiled down to, if I'm completely honest, is this. I desperately wanted to control everything so that I could feel more stabilized and secure. And I could feel that those communities that I call my people at least had a chance to go in the direction of dismantling oppression. I wanted to feel agency and power 
of course, instead of feeling crushed, overwhelmed, and powerless. So therefore, the, there's an invitation to you as a kind of experiment to notice when you go into reactive mode and those words come up, those idiots, those assholes, those other wrong-headed fools in whatever form. Um, some of my meditation students say they like to imagine me perched on their shoulder. They call it mini musham, your internalized mindfulness teacher. So that's not me, obviously. That's a little projection. Um, and ask. Um, and let Minnie Moosh say to you, um, how can we create some mindful space around this? And consider this, you don't have to believe it, consider this, that everything that I may be saying in that kind of anger and rage and judgment about those others very likely they are thinking and saying and writing the same things about me and my people. The divides in this country are huge at this moment. Pandemic is keeping us physically separated. Parts of the economy are collapsing and climate crisis was already been rolling for many years. So how is it that we build movements which involve by necessity bridging differences, creating coalitions, even possibly as international mediator the Canadian mediator Adam Kahane, K-A-H-A-N-E, says in his book, it's on YouTube, even possibly collaborating with the enemy. In situations of entrenched and multi-generational hatred and killing. And we can enter into this invitation to ourselves, to go from WTF to, please tell me more. How could I find out more? It doesn't have to be some kind of spiritual or, you know, idealized, blissful, we are all one and we shall be peaceful and hold hands. I'm, as Cassie was pointed out, I'm not like that myself, actually. I'm just not. <laughs> And um, I accept that bitter conflicts are a reality. As a person of color, I've been subject to racism. As a woman, I've been subject to sexism. I understand these, matter, these are matters of life and death. And I do have a spiritual basis in Buddhism. I do believe we all have goodness in ourselves. That's just me. You don't have to believe that. You know what your own beliefs are and you can clarify those. So without necessarily even going there, why would we want to go towards more skillful speech? And one answer is this. It can be what um, I took a kind of a turn in my development recently and I began to do study in hostage negotiation. And I read this book called Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It by Chris Voss, V-O-S-S. -S. And I've continued this study uh, for, I don't know, about a year now, maybe a couple of years, along with mediation. And actually, it was through dialogue with Kazu that I asked myself, even if I consider that I don't want to go to this 
idealized place. If I'm in a fight for my rights and my people's rights for equality, for uh, to get out of this stranglehold, as I see it, of um, oppression of toxic capitalism that is here, that is, that is with us, has been with us for many, many generations. Is it better to know the tactics, the beliefs, the strategies of the so-called enemy and other for our own purposes or to shield ourselves from that understanding through hurling insults and through dismissive and demeaning language. Chris Voss, in his work on hostage, uh, he's a former FBI hostage negotiator, now applying these techniques to business, introduces the idea of tactical empathy. Tactical empathy. This is belief, based on the belief and assertion that all human beings' needs have basic needs when they are under un, just intolerable stress, which is a hostage situation. These are not needs for food, for shelter. They are needs to feel in control, to feel safe enough, and to feel heard and understood. So can we open? In closing, I'll say, thank you for listening. In closing, I'll say, can we open? And the answer might be no. Um, but I'm just asking you to try it on. If we go into a situation and in an interaction with an idea of I'm going to practice tactical empathy here. Please tell me more. We might even think so I can win. So I can get rid of the other and the world will be better for it. If I'm really honest, we might go actually, I might go into a situation in that way. I'm not gonna say it because it doesn't sound very social. That's really what I'll be thinking. But can we be open to the possibility that in this interchange of please tell me more, because of the way our brains are wired, because of the way our bodies interact with one another, even across Zoom, I'm seeing you. I'm seeing your facial expressions. I'm seeing some of your body language. It doesn't mean I totally get you and I want to. Because of how we are as beings in the world, can we open to the fact that uh, the possibility that we might be changed or transformed in the process of please tell me more. This is not necessarily converted to become the feared other. That's usually other, capital O. That's usually the fear. But can we open to the possibility that we might be changed in making an exponential leap, an evolutionary leap that is quite possible if we slow down and open up, slow down and open up instead of speeding up to shut down and close off. To go to, oh, now I understand more about where you're coming from. I understand more about your deepest values, a little more about your family, where you grew up, why you believe what you believe. I may not agree with it. I understand more. There can be a journey and I invite you my friends, to take it with me. A journey from three letters, WTF, or three words, what the F, what the fuck, to three different words. Please tell me.
And if you're willing to try on what I'm saying, I can actually guarantee you from my own experience of a year, I'm a Buddhist, of a year and a half of Bible study that I did with my local Jehovah's Witnesses some years ago, that there is a journey. There's a journey of increased understanding. There's a journey of better communication. And it has the potential to be a journey of understanding, of connection, of surprising respect, and of deepening love. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back to Kazu, Chris, and Astrid, and um, they will invite you if you'd like to go into uh, some breakout rooms, and then we can come back for a little bit of Q&A. And I would just invite you to share with one another what um, you heard, what was possibly impactful for you, and anything that you want to share about your own journey at the present moment to deal constructively, to, to meet, to respond out of, um, to respond with the most hope we have for what the new world is going to be that we're entering into and what your part in it is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mushin. Very much appreciating your words and your, your presence uh, as you delivered those words. And uh, yeah, as Mushin just uh, said, we'll in just a moment be breaking into small groups uh, in breakout rooms. If you haven't already and you're a, a Black, Indigenous, or um, person of color who wishes to be in a breakout room, with other Black, Indigenous, and POC, please send Kazu a, a quick message in the chat. You can pri privately um, chat with Kazu and just let him know that that's your desire. Uh, Kazu will be organizing the rooms in just a, in a moment. Um, before we move into breakout rooms, I wanna uh, just ask for your uh, attention for a brief uh, presentation that I wanna offer that has to do with uh, East Point Peace Academy's uh, gift economics uh, approach. Um, we don't charge a fee for anything and we work on a gift econ economics model that I, I want to uh, acknowledge East Bay Meditation Center as one of the inspirations for the model that we use. I'm gonna just quickly share my screen and tell you a few things about East Point's approach to gift economics. As I mentioned, we don't charge for any of our offerings, uh, and that's, um, I would say, mostly to do with our desire to have our offerings be accessible to as many human beings as possible. And by not charging, that opens the gate much wider, not as wide as we would like, as there's still barriers to access beyond economics, but it's a big one um, to, to let go of uh, as a barrier um, for folks' participation. These are the seven principles of the gift economy as, as East Point practices, practices them. Um, we don't have time to go into all of them, but you can just sort of scan this slide to get a sense of the spirit of, of the why that we're doing this. Um, we're basically trying to move away from the extractive capitalist uh, eco economy into a more relational, empowering uh, form of e e economics that enables us to do the work we feel called to, to be of support to each other as we do it. Um, one of the principles, transparency, is deeply important to us. And for that reason, we're sharing here kind of the financial breakdown of, of last year for us. And this, this is pretty much the same sort of budget that we're looking at this year. Somewhere in the neighborhood of $120,000 are the expenses for our organization for all of our um, various programs. 
And you can see here that almost 100,000 of that last year was raised from the community, not from uh, grants from foundations. Um, we rely very heavily on the support of folks like you. And you can see here that over a thousand people participated in our nonviolence and conflict reconciliation workshops um, in communities across six different states and in um, several prison facilities uh, here in Northern California. Here's some photos of our beloved community, the folks who've been through our workshops. Obviously, in-person workshops have um, been put on hold during COVID, but you can see here a mix of uh, inmates uh, in various facilities where we do our workshops as well as community-based workshops too. Here's a great quote from Marshall Rosenberg. As we, we asked you to consider whether or not you would like to offer a gift to East Point Peace Academy today, um, you can just keep this quote in mind. When giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. This is an invitation for folks to come through our workshops and our other offerings like this uh, speaker series to just ask yourself whether or not it would bring you joy to make an offering to East Point in support of the work that we're doing in the community. And if that's the case, if you, if you would like to make an offering today, you can do so uh, at our website, eastpointpeace.org. And if you would use the backslash Mushim donate, that way we'll be able to track uh, that, that your, um, your giving today uh, was for this particular, in, in connection with this particular offering. And uh, we wanna make a special sort of uh, shout out for those who join us as monthly donors. It's really helpful for us to have consistent monthly income as a small grassroots nonprofit. We're often just doing this by, you know, a very shoestring budget. Um, and it's really helpful to have people consistently give. So if you're thinking of throwing in $20, to $20 please consider doing $5 a month for, for four months. Or you know you can you can do the math and that will be very helpful for us to build our uh, sort of base of support. Great. Well, thanks a lot for your attention um, for that little presentation, and that brings us now to uh, breakout rooms. So uh, we're going to send you into small groups, I believe, of three or four folks, and. Um, Mushim offered the, the prompt before uh, I gave the gift economic spiel. Um, Mushim, would you be willing just to kind of rephrase that one more time so folks can have it fresh in their minds as they go into their breakout rooms? I was afraid you were going to ask that. <laughs> Sorry. I did not write it down. Um, just put yes. it in the chat, Mushim. Pardon? Uh, I wrote down, I summarized, I tried to summarize what you said and I just put it into the chat for everyone. Could you just read it aloud quickly and then? Yep, so what I captured was, what did you hear? What was impactful? And this is my kind of paraphrasing of what you said. What is your own journey in terms of responding to this moment in constructive ways? Welcome back, folks. We'll give people a few more seconds to come back. Welcome back. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm just jumping in before you continue to remind all the speakers to adopt uh, a mindful pace for closed captioning. Thank you. Great. So now it's time for us to have a question and answer period. 
Um, and I want to invite folks to either raise your hand uh, virtually. Um, let's see, if you press the, or click on the participants button, you can see that there's a little place where you can raise your hand if you click. I see that Sandy has her hand up. So I'm gonna go ahead and call on Sandy. Hello. Um, are you able to hear me? Yep, okay. go for it. Uh, so my question uh, speaks to an opening statement that Musham had said about having different strategies towards liberation. And uh, one thing that I've been struggling with is feeling like I'm never enough in certain activist circles and um, for other people being called out of my name if I don't have, like I'm not decolonized enough or um, just certain things that I don't really appreciate. So I then shut down. So I don't know if there's any recommendations as to how to still be open when it comes to having different visions of what liberation looks like for all of us, because what looks like liberation for me is not the same for you, is not the same for the family over there. So how can we also not just think, oh, it's left and right or conservative, Republican and liberal left, but also within communities that are working towards healing and liberation as well. Like how can we listen to each other without attacking each other's character if we don't fit that ideal of activism or anti-racism and so forth? Sandy, that's such an essential question. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to say that um, I'm really sorry that you've been on the end of judgments about you're not decolonized enough and um, it's all very familiar to me for sure. And so what I would personally recommend, so there, there are a couple things. Uh, first of all, I think that your your question and comment had so much in it. And the second part was, how can we be together when, in fact, diversity and difference is is a reality, right? And I've said to one person in the last couple of years, and this is just me, that I think that in the same way that I believe that as human beings, we have evolved over many, many years and from previous life forms. That's my particular, I do, I do believe that. And I, I said, I think it's probably just as big a leap and as essential a leap for us right now as maybe going from being creatures who breathe through gills to creatures with lungs, you know, like pulling ourselves up, to go from either or thinking, us versus them thinking, to both and thinking that acknowledges multiple realities and to begin to expand, to be able to hold those. Again, this is not about agreeing with everyone. Yes, there are people whose views and positions are repugnant to me. However, will I do better understanding that those viewpoints better or not? That's tactically how I think. And of course, we could also go in the spiritual direction of beloved community and whatever version we have of that. So thank you. I wanted to back off to, from that and go to this never enough in activist uh, circles. And again, I am, um, I think, a pretty experienced mommy. <laughs> I live with my adult child, who is 31. And... Um, um, who went through the Oakland Public Schools K through 12. And I was there volunteering and all of this kind of stuff. And to just, again, um, maybe sort of zoom back, acknowledge your own feeling of injury, because of course, 
and of the frustrating qualities of the situation, just kind of zoom back and imagine if you would like um, people like you stupid, you stupid, yelling at one another, you're not woke enough. Well, the only reason that you say that is you're not woke enough. You don't seem to realize you better fucking wake up because you're not woke. You have to decolonize yourself. No, it's you who, do you see what I'm saying? I see that kind of energy get put into motion through trauma, through injury, through frustration. And if we just back off and look at it, I don't know about you, I feel that tightness, the, the air has been sucked out of the room. There's simply no air. There isn't enough space for me to say, hey, Sandy, please tell me more about yourself. And since we can't control other people, what we can do that I invite you to do is empower yourself and if you like, invite other people. Model how you wish to be in the world. And I invite you to say this mantra, I am completely enough. That will be your own journey. And I wanna tell you, I believe you're enough. probably more than enough. Kind of magnificent, actually. <laughs> I'm just looking at you. Thank you so much, Nishin. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for all the wisdom that you have given us and the work that you've done now with us and before. Just, I appreciate you so much and I appreciate your voice so much. Thank you, Sandy. You too. Yes, thanks for your question, Sandy. I, I was remiss uh, before in, in not mentioning uh, that it's, it's our practice at East Point. It's, it's a new practice, which is why I, I was remiss in, in not mentioning it, that we, we invite, uh, first off, uh, folks who identify as Black, Indigenous, as people of color to offer questions, to make space for those questions before moving to folks who identify as white. My assumption in this case was that that worked out fine, Sandy. I don't want to make, you know, yeah, thank you. Um, so, thumbs up. yeah, appreciate that. And so just putting out um, that request for any folks who identify as Black, Indigenous, or, or POC to offer your questions. Um, and you can either raise your hand or you feel free to put questions in the chat and Kazu, Astrid, and I will be sort of monitoring those. Uh, I see uh, Daisy has her hand up. So go for it, Daisy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. And thank you so much. I so appreciated what you shared about after the election, realizing, okay, if I'm being honest, this is about not having control. I just love that insight. It helped me to realize I never got to that insight for myself. <laughs> um, and so I was curious if you could maybe break that down even more. Um, because, yeah, it just, it was so helpful for me. Thank you. Like, ha like how you got to that insight, I guess. Thank you. Good to see you, Daisy. Um, how I got to that insight. Um, I, I honestly think it's, it's what I said. It's years of being a mother and being in the public schools and being with children who, when they're young, are quite unfiltered and often quite violent <laughs> and just naturally. I mean, it's, they're not being bad. It's just the way it is. I was, remember I was with one mother in, my, in the co-op preschool my kid went to and I heard all this, I was talking to her on the phone and I heard all this screaming. She had three children, young children. She said, I have to go. She said, the middle, the middle kid is trying to strangle the baby. <laughs> And, you know, they were actually like great kids. It was just kind of normal. Um, so it, it really has been through my journey as a parent and as a volunteer in the Oakland public um, schools that, uh, as well as in the Buddhist communities and the activist communities, that I've seen time and time again that, um, well, I'll give you an example. This easily could have been me. 
years ago, I was on the board of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, and I was talking to another board member, and I don't know, we were fighting about something, there was something contentious on the board, and my friend who was on the board said, this is the way it is. And she broke it down and she said, and this is what's going to have to happen. And there is, she ended with, there is only one way to look at it. And I said, I'm so sorry to disappoint you, but I actually have further information that you don't yet have. And there isn't one way to look at it. There is a whole other side. And I told her and she said, oh, now that you say that, I can, I can see that that is. And she went from, there is only, okay, there can only be one way. And that can be me as well. So it's been through years and years of looking at my own mind and my own reactivity and what the benefits are of that re reactivity that helped me to have that insight. And I also wanted to inject into this that everyone may be different for me. Uh, when I, with mindfulness, look at, uh, what I get out of you stupid, you fuckhead, that kind of thing, you know, um, it's like, it's a, like a little burst of dopamine. It is joyful. It's so exciting. I feel powerful. I feel in control. I feel like I'm a warrior and I'm going to go out and I'm going to defeat. And so I'm, I'm actually getting something very good out of it um, in the short term. Over the long term, as as a political being, as someone who believes in movement building and strategy and coalition, who sees a need for that, that does not serve me as well. Thank you. Oh, it says in the chat, I'm going to change my WTF to wait, think, feel. Yes. And then act mindfully. I love that. Wait, I better write that down for myself. Wait, think, feel. Yes. And we can feel all our rage. We can feel our grief. This is not talking about becoming some kind of robot. We need to, and we need to do in a way that it doesn't injure and destroy us. It needs to become transformed into the fuel that will help all of us. Ready for another question, Mushum? I am. Okay, I see Tanya has a hand up. Go for it. I was just trying to think through this question because um, I was talking about it in the in the breakout room, and I'm not sure I, I like articulated it the way I wanted to. But so I know I thank you, Mushum, very much for um, for your talk and for answering questions. Um, I'm thinking, you know, so obviously we can't control other people, right? But can we help them along, <laughs> right? Like how do we remind people in the moment, right? To, that this is not a life or death situation, right? That this moment though it may feel supercharged, um, like I'm not your enemy, right? Like you put it, like, so how, how can we help them along? Like take a breath, right? Like what are just like some really uh, practical techniques that you found? I think it takes a lot of training and East Point Peace Academy does trainings in nonviolence, which is not only a stance, it's a practice and it's a tough one too. And it's very imperfect and always in progress. Um, yeah, for myself, um, what if if someone um, is very like angry and upset with me? The first thing that I'm going to want to do, of course, is to check on my own safety. I'm not a martyr. Hey, I want it. I do want to be reasonably safe and safe enough. And if I feel that I am, there are other people around in case this person gets violent or whatever, um, that's for me to judge how I can be reasonably safe. That's the first judgment. Um, and if I'm not, then do what I need to do to take care of myself. If I feel I'm reasonably safe, then I'm going to want to switch into, please tell me more.
So what they say may strike me as being, I'm going to might judge it from here to eternity. That's illogical. That's stupid. Oh my God. How could you even think that? Oh, well, you're not informed. It's so on and so forth. So in other words, to help other people along, I've got to help myself along. And I want to model that way of being in the world of please tell me more. And one reason that that's maybe a little easier for me, um, which I invite all of you to do is sometimes I think of myself, I'm a writer and I'm a student of literature. And I think, yeah, like if this were a novel, like a really cool novel, how could I learn more about this particular character? What motivates them? What's their life like? What's their, their part in the plot and the, and the action? Uh, because otherwise, if, you know, if we weren't, didn't have that capacity, I always say we would end up with um, fiction and novels in which we opened it up and said, there were really nice people. They lived peacefully and sustainably in a very good world. And um, they helped each other die in a very loving manner, the end. Thank you, Mushin. Okay, uh, looks like we just have maybe three or four minutes left. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, call on Lauren to offer one last question, unless it's super short and we might get to another one. Go for it, Lauren. Okay, thank you, Kazu, for finding my question uh, from the form. Um, if I'm in a group context and one person says something really harmful, what is a helpful way to respond? If I respond in the group, that one person might feel called out and defensive, but it could be a learning opportunity for the whole group. If I respond to that one person privately, does my silence in the group convey that I'm condoning the statement? Thank you, Lauren. Um, Sorry, I read that super fast. I'm going to put that in the chat. Thank you. So what I heard you say is if you're in a group, someone says something harmful, which I would um, maybe push to say perhaps it's um, racist, some form of institutionalized hatred, um, is to first understand that um, statements that I regard as harmful that I'm noting the impact on me. And I don't, unless the person says, and I'm saying this because I hate y'all's guts and I want to kill you, which is rare. If it does, a different kind of action is needed, rare. That I'm going to assume that I don't necessarily understand the intention of that person. And then I'm going to follow what more, uh, my coach, who is a Buddhist teacher and an organizational development consultant told me is actually the classic HR formula in giving feedback. And that is to briefly describe what it is that I heard said, number one. So behavior, action, the words, not interpreting them. This is what I heard you say. This is what I saw you do, number one. Number two, to take responsibility. This was the impact on me not to say, and everybody's reeling in horror, unless you've done a poll of everybody. So that's a little hard. We have to stand up for it. This was the impact on me. I found that to be incredibly racist and hurtful because, and then the third part is then to place a request. Therefore, I request that, which gives the other person, they don't necessarily need to answer a request. However, it gives them the opportunity to make it right if they're thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't intend that at all. Would you do that in the group or in a private thing? And how would you respond to the impact on the group if you do it privately? I think I would try to do it um, within the group because um, silence is often interpreted as being either approval or it could be uh, I'm not moved enough to take a stand, or it could be um, it could be interpreted as um, well. I guess we're all just rolling over to this, and none of those are alternatives that I like. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that excellent question, Lauren. And 
Mushim, I'm just gonna hand it right back to you for any closing remarks you, you wanna share with the group before we say our farewell for tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have one minute and I again, thank you all and invite you to keep the discussion rolling in any way that it's alive for you. And I invite you now to once again, um, consider turning on your video camera if it's off, you don't need to, so that we can look one at one another. We're separated in space. We're not separated in time. This moment is the moment in which more understanding can arise, more real love and compassion can arise. And we can learn more about one another and accompany one another on this journey that we call our human life. This moment is so precious to me. I'm loving looking at all of you, thank you. And if you like, unmute, or maybe you can unmute, and let's just say goodbye to one another. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you for Bye. Thank you for watching. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, East Point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to all the admins. Bye, Kazu. Bye, Chris. Thank you. Thank you all.